Motherhood Today. Motherhood Today. Our text that we read earlier was found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. And that's where we're going to be looking at this morning. And I understand from all that I know about motherhood, which isn't a whole lot, being a guy, but talking to mothers, I know that it can be a difficult thing of being a Christian mother today. But as hard as it may be, we need to realize that difficulties are not unique in just our times. In every age, motherhood has had its share of difficulties. From our text in Luke's Gospel, the chapter 1, I believe that there is much that we can learn from the mother of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, from Mary and her life. So this morning, while we have time together, I want us to look at her, look at the mother of our Lord, and consider some of the difficulties that she faced back then, but then how we can apply it to ourselves and our lives today. The first difficulty that Mary faced was this, and this is number one. She faced difficulty of a tarnished reputation. Mary was pregnant out of wedlock, but now we know the rest of the story that, that the child in her womb was of the Holy Spirit, and he is the Son of God. He is God in human flesh. We know that. But do you really think that the people back then believed that this little Jewish maiden, this little handmaiden, in this little town of Nazareth was going to be the mother of the Messiah. If you come from a small town, you know that juicy, juicy gossip is a hot item. I remember living in a time where where we had party lines. Some of you that are my age or older, you may remember them. When your telephone, you had party lines. And you had so many rings, and when it rang like three long rings and a couple shorts, that was yours. And if it rang two shorts and one long, that was the lady or people down the street, and you weren't supposed to answer it. Uh, notice I said you weren't supposed to answer that. But when an item like that came around in a small town, that was the hot item. And it spread, didn't it? All over. So-and-so is a young teenager. She's young 20. She's not married. And oh my goodness, she is pregnant. I believe it happened here. I don't believe that Nazareth was any different than St. Genevieve, DeSoto, Ironton, or any other little town that you can name. When an unmarried teenage girl was expecting a, um, a child, can you imagine the joy that the gossipers shot out? It spread, as the old saying goes, like wildfire. Now, application time. None of us are perfect. None of us ever will be perfect. Amen? Amen? And so on this Mother's Day, moms, I'm talking to you. In a couple of weeks, I'll be talking to dad. So if you want your dad to get an earful, have him come in a couple of weeks on Father's Day. And we'll hear that. But on this Mother's Day, some of you may not feel too comfortable. Maybe there's something in your past that you're just not very proud of. Something you said, something you did, some way you acted. And you feel guilty about it. Maybe there's a dark skeleton in your closet somewhere that you have not told anybody, but it's there. And you feel unworthy as a mom. Well, let me tell you this, and I know you know this, but I want to reassure you this. Let me remind you this, that God not only forgives when you ask him to forgive you, he forgets it. Amen? He's not like we are. Well, a lot of times we'll say, well, I'll forgive, but I won't forget. And every time you see that person, whatever it was, boy, it flares up. 
I am so thankful that Almighty God is not that way. That when I go before Him or when you go before Him and you ask Him to forgive you of your sins and, and your past and what you've done and what you've said and how you've lived your life, and He says, I forgive you, that's the end of it. I thank God for that. Now, moms, if you had that past, and it's kind of like Mary here, who had a little bit of a tarnished reputation, because you know the word got out. Let me encourage you to encourage your children not to repeat the same mistakes you did, but to realize that if they do, that we have a loving God, a mighty God, who is full of mercy and grace, and that He will forgive you. And that you've had a new beginning with Him, and so encourage them to live lives that are worthy of His love, but also let them know that if they fall, if they slip, stumble and fall, and if they're truly sorry and they ask God to forgive them, He will forgive them. Secondly, Mary faced the difficulty of poverty. The book of Philippians says that Jesus was rich and then became poor for our sake. And I really, as I study Scripture, and the longer I live and the more I'm around people, I don't think that we really realize how poor Mary and Joseph really were. Because you see, when the Lord was brought to the temple as a baby for the very first time, and you remember they had to do the sacrifices? Joseph and Mary offered two doves. That sacrifice was for the poorest of the poor in that society. That's how poor they were. They were not wealthy, never were, weren't meant to be. And if you find yourself this morning in that position and you, and you say that, Pastor, listen, I am poor. And you have that feeling in that, 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 in that, that position and you've experienced the, the pressures of trying to buy things for your children, you know, the best name running shoes or the best name designer clothes. I remember when my niece was a little girl in junior high. And she had these one pair of shoes, and I, I'm sure all you women do this. You have that one pair of shoes that you just like better than any of the others. Yeah, you have these, but boy, every time you go to these, because these are just so comfortable, and they just, they feel good. And I remember Gail as a little girl, she, she had these shoes, and she just loved them that her mom had gotten for her, and she wore them to school one day, and it just so happened that she wore them to school the next day. And she was in a class with another little boy, and he, he stood there, and he looked down at her feet. I don't know why he was looking at her feet instead of looking at the teacher and listening to her, but he was. And he said, is that the only pair of shoes you've got? Boy, it just tore out her heart. But it was what she had, and she was proud of it, and she was glad that she had them. Her mom worked hard for him. But you know and I know the pressures of buying children of the best things and the best designer names and labels and the best running shoes and all the other things that they just feel that they've got to have. Let me encourage you moms to take time to teach them that life does not consist of the abundance of things we possess. Okay? It just doesn't. You can't take it with you when you die. I've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul and where you can take stuff with you. I've never seen that in all my years. Let me encourage you to teach them that there are other things much more important than just possessions. And those things that are more important are eternal things. They cannot see them, but they will last forever and ever, and that is their, their salvation, their walk with God. I remember a lady from our church that we attended down in East Texas, and her first name, I'll only give her her first name, was Jean. And her and her family spent several years living in a small, ran down, and very ran down mobile home. And she told us of her raising her children in that kind of environment. 
of just almost going hand to mouth day to day. And she said one day her son came home from school and he announced at supper time that one of his friends at school had ran away from home. And Jean said she looked at her children and said, I don't understand. He lives in a very nice home, a very wealthy home. He has everything that a child could ever want or desire. Why would he run away from home? And her son, who knew the boy, answered, he said, well, I can answer that question, Mom. He said, yeah, they live in a nice home, and he has all the things that anybody, any kid could ever want. And that they have a lot of in stuff in their environment at the home. He said, but one thing they lack is they don't have much love in their home. He said, you see, Mom, he said, in our home, we don't have much things and brand name things. He said, but the one thing we do have in this home of ours is love. Application time from this is this. Love is free, and while it may not be free, it does cost. It costs time and attention and emotions. We need to give that love to our children. Amen. We need to give it to our children. The greatest thing that I could accomplish on this earth, now I'm stepping away from moms for just a moment, but the greatest thing that I could, on this earth that I could do for our daughter is this, is that I could leave this earth knowing that her mom, her dad, loved her. Loved the Lord. And to teach her to love the Lord. But that we loved her. And if I can walk out of this world, either through death or the rapture, and my daughter knows that, I have accomplished everything that I've wanted to accomplish is that my child knew that I loved her and that her mother loved her. Number three, Mary faced the difficulty of being a single mom. We don't know what happened to Joseph. Many scholars believe that he died when Jesus was either in his late teens or early 20s. The last time he's really mentioned in the scriptures is when the Lord was 12 years old and you remember they brought him into the temple and there in Jerusalem. You remember mom and dad even kind of left and they thought he was with one of the other family members They got a day's journey away and they pitched in and it was like, hey, where's, where's the boy? Well, I don't know. I thought he was with this one. Well, I thought he was with that one. Oh, my goodness. And poor Mary and Joseph, they go back to Jerusalem and there he is in the temple. Then they leave with him. And that's the last we hear of Joseph. It's the last that he's mentioned. So Mary becomes a single mom. She becomes a single mom raising Jesus, her son, and, and her other children by herself. Application time. I want to say to single moms, if there are any that are listening or, or, or here this morning, and I don't believe there are, but if there are, our hats are off to you. Because you are having to be both mom and dad to your children. I can't imagine what that would be like. Just on a personal note, I, I thank God for my mom because she was both mom and dad to my sister and I. We lost our dad when I was 10 years old. And she stepped in, and she stepped up to the plate, and she was both mom and dad. And for a young kid, a young boy, it was probably not a whole lot of fun. So if you find yourself in that position, we, our hat is off to you here at Grace Baptist Church, and we say thank you because you've done double work. And we pray that God blesses you and your children for what you're doing in a society today like that. Now, we've seen the difficulties of Mary, and now I want us to see, secondly, the resources that Mary had. Yes, she faced difficulties, but she also had some very valuable resources about her. The first resource was her strong commitment to doing God's will. 
We read in Luke 1, verse 35, that the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And you let your eyes drop down to verse 38, and Mary has, has a question. She says, or she has an answer to that. She says, Behold the bond slave. That is the lowest of all slaves, a bond slave. Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your words. And the angel, it said, departed from her. We've got to remember that time back then where Mary was alive compared to today is totally different. Back in those days when a young girl, an unmarried young girl, became pregnant out of wedlock, if she was engaged to a guy, he could have her stoned to death. And more than likely, her dad would have agreed with it. That was the society in which they lived. That was their, the, the engaged guy, the, the uh, boyfriend who was engaged to marry to this girl. That was his right to do. Mary said, may it be done to me what God wills. She knew that the baby in her womb was God's only begotten son and that by giving birth to Jesus, she was doing exactly what God had commissioned and called her to do in her life. Every prayer of every Jewish mama and daddy was that their daughter would be the mother of Messiah. Every Jewish mama and daddy prayed that for their child, for their daughter. And here, Mary is the chosen one. Second is this. She had the resource of Jesus being an obedient child. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Can you imagine, moms, having a child that is totally obedient to you? Like, say, Jesus. Now, if you're a child, think about this. Am I being totally obedient to my mom? She was kind of on the other foot, isn't it? Some of you moms are probably thinking, boy, if I had a child like that, that was totally obedient. My life would be so much easier. Well, let me ask you this. Are we, as adults, even though we still have our moms, are we being obedient to them? Are we showing respect to them? Mary had the wonderful blessing of a child, yes, who was totally obedient. He could do no else. But you know what? The best thing that we can do and the best thing that we can give our moms on this Mother's Day is our obedience to them our care to them, our respect for them. Now, I'm not saying don't do this, but it's better than a card. Amen, moms? You have a child, no matter how old they are, if that child is obedient to you and show respect to you, it's better than flowers, it's better than chocolate. Those things fade away and fall apart and you throw them in the trash after a while. But boy, to have a child that is obedient, wouldn't all you moms love to have that gift? Just being a loving, obedient child, no matter how old we are, is a great thing. Here's the other thing. Mary had a supportive husband. She had a supportive husband. Again, we know that Joseph was with her for at least 12 years. If some of church historians say late teens, early 20s. But however time that God allowed for Mary and Joseph to be together, it, it, it's so obvious that Joseph was supportive of Mary. In Matthew's gospel, the first, cha first chapter, the 24th verse, that verse tells us that Joseph awoke from his sleep and, and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and he took Mary as his wife. Remember, Joseph heard that G uh, Mary is going to have a baby. He knows it's not his. 
Now, he's human. He's no different than you and I. And what does he think? What's the first thing that comes to his mind? Well, wait a minute. That is not my child. So that means that she was unfaithful to me, and we are engaged. And in those days, an engagement was almost as if they were married. She is pregnant with another man's child. But Joseph loved her and cared for her, and he thought, you know, I could bring her before the city and have her stoned to death because of her unfaithfulness. I could divorce her and be done with her and just, it's all over. But then he has this, this vision. And in Valley Paraphrase that I do every so often, in Valley Paraphrase, that angel said, hey, Joseph, don't worry about it. It'll be okay. It'll be all right. And Joseph wakes up from his vision, and he did exactly as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and he took Mary as his wife. And I've always imagined that Joseph was a caring, supportive husband to Mary. He was there for her whenever she needed him. Thick and thin. Tough times, good times. He was there to support her. And to all of us husbands and fathers, let me say this this morning to us, the best thing that you can give your wife this Mother's Day, the mother of your children, is not flowers, not chocolates, not a card. The best thing that we can give the mother of our children is our support for her, our prayers for her, and to encourage her and to always be there however long we have on this earth to always be there for her. So application time. Husbands, fathers, be a, good, be a good supportive husband and father to your wife, the mother of your children. Now here's a little summary from what, what is learned from the life of Mary. Because of Mary's faithfulness, God rewarded her. He rewarded her faithfulness as mom. She was there, think of this, she was there to see the Lord resurrected from the dead. Can you imagine being a mom and you see your son, especially in this time period of our Lord, being crucified on that cross, which was nothing but for criminals, bad people, and you knew your son and you see him crucified, you see your religious leaders make fun of him, laugh at him, mock him, and you see them pronouncing him dead, and you see them taking him down from the cross and putting him in, not even his own family tomb, in a borrowed tomb. And I believe in your human heart you would be so despondent, you would be so down, so depressed, but here, Mary is rewarded to see on, on the third day that, she, that her son is resurrected from the dead. And if that's not a blessing enough, she is in the upper room with the other 120 that is gathered together to pray, and the Holy Spirit came upon them. What a blessing that would be, all because of her son. And not only that, but that she also lived to see her other children accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. What a blessing to have all your kids that come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And the God who rewarded Mary, listen, He has promised to reward you as well. And He will. Now, let me leave you with this this morning. Beloved Mother's Days, is, it's, it's, for lack of better words, it's kind of like a mixed bag. Uh, when it comes to Mother's Days, I, I never know for sure exactly how to handle it because I know that there's all kinds of different people who will be present on Mother's Day that comes to church. I know for some of you, you have 
experience the death of your moms, and this could be a day of mourning where you're down a little bit, you're grieving as you remember her and how much you miss her and, and how much you would love to even talk to her again. I know there are some women that are married and they, uh, they are childless and they may feel empty and they may, be, may feel perhaps unfulfilled because we put so much pressure when young people get married, whether we realize it or not, as parents and parenting laws and in society, we put so much pressure on our kids to hurry up and have kids, right? We put so much pressure. And when the child doesn't have a kids and doesn't, they don't have them as fast as we think they should, we put even more pressure on them. And I think sometimes we do that and the young girl feels empty and, and unfulfilled. Or you may be here this morning and, and you didn't have a good relationship with your mom. You had a poor relationship with your mother. And you feel a little bit guilty now. And you wish somehow you could undo that which was done in the past. And for some of us, it may be too late. Well, let me, app, application time again. Ladies, let me say this, and I don't say this easily. I don't say it offhandedly, but hang in there. Hang in there. Continue walking with God. And He will bless you. He will bless your obedience. There are times that, yes, you have poor, we have poor relationships with our parents. And uh, they've gone on. And there's nothing that we can do about it. We can ask God to forgive us. We can't ask them to forgive us because they're not going to respond. But we can ask God to forgive us and to help us not to do that again. So just hang in there, ladies and moms, and uh, continue walking with him. And we will pray for you as you pray for us. And moms, I just want you to know that God's power is yours. He will help you as a mom raising your children if you'll call upon him. And we need as adults, I hope not just today, but if no other day, at least today, that we... Let our moms, if we can, let them know that we love them and we thank God for them. And they are so special to us. I pray that God blesses you moms on this very special day. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for our example of Mary, the mother of our Lord. And what we can learn from her and basically... She is no different than every other mom that's walked the face of this earth. She faced heartaches and, and pain and hurts. But she also had great resources that our moms of today even have. Father, be with us as husbands and fathers. Help us to be supportive to our wives and to stand with them, Father. We thank you for this time in your word in Luke's gospel. We thank you for this time that we can come into your house and to look at your word, to study your word. But Father, help us to apply your word. And Father, we do, again, thank you for all the moms and what all they mean to us and how they have blessed us and nourished us and taken care of us when we were, from the time we were born, for many even to this day, how they took care of us. Thank you for the moms that have gone on before us. We thank you for their example. We pray that we learn from that example and to follow it, to improve upon it if possible, and to continue walking with you. Father, I pray that you just be with us and guide us as we go from this house of worship out into the world today and that we will carry your love and your redemptive story to the lost and dying world. Father, we pray as we sing the song that we're about to sing 
that if you are working in people's lives, if you are speaking to them, that they will obey you and obey you promptly. And that, Father, when we leave, we will know that we've had a fresh encounter with the living God. In Christ's name we pray. In Jesus Christ. Third, we can stand firm in the face of opposition. Listen to what the Lord said. He says, but the one who will endure to the end, he will, or we could say she will be saved. Now the end may not, it may not be the end of this age. It may mean the, or refer to the end of your life. And in a time when our culture is sinking in, in the shifting sand of popular opinion and, and morality by the majority, I believe with all my heart, beloved, and I want to say this as forcefully as I know how, and with all the courage that I can say to you, that I believe to this day God is looking for people who will stand up for what is right. What do I mean by that? What the Word of God says. Someone said the person who will stand for nothing will fall for anything, and I believe that. Persecution, Christian persecution, is going to grow against believers in America. We have been blessed for a number of years. We haven't seen it a lot here in our country. All we read of it down in Central and South America. We read about it over in Africa and Asia and in the Middle East. But beloved, I'm telling you this morning that there will come a time where you and I will see persecution right here in the United States of America. And I believe as the Church of Jesus Christ, as Grace Baptist Church, continues to preach and teach the uncompromising truth, one that a fetus is a living person who deserves, and de deserves a chance to live, meaning pro-life, and that marriage is, de is defined by God as being through one man and one woman. If you stand on that, and if you stand on the fact that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven, through a personal relationship with, with God through the blood of Jesus, we will be criticized and we will be condemned we will be pressured to try to change our position. And we're seeing it in some churches today. And again, I say this with all the boldness that I have. As for myself and Grace Baptist Church of St. Genevieve, beloved, we will not compromise the word of Almighty God. Amen? Amen. We will not. Compromise the Word of God. I believe what we need is a generation, starting with you and I today, a generation of fearless Christians like Martin Luther, one of the old Protestant reformers, who said when he was given a chance to recant his stands, he said this, he said, Here I stand... I can do no otherwise. I believe we need to take that same stand. And when the world tries to push us and pressure us to compromise our faith in Jesus Christ, we should stand with Martin Luther and say, Here I stand. I can do no otherwise. Now let me leave you with this this morning. What is this world coming to? I wrote down, I don't know. I do know, but I don't know. I do know it's coming to evil. But something I know more important than that. 
is there is coming a time when the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return to this earth and call his children home to be with him in heaven. We know it as the rapture. And all of history has been moving toward that one event. Think of it this way, beloved. When Jesus Christ ascended into heaven, okay, remember that day? He ascended into heaven. The next greatest event to take place on the earth will be his coming again for his children out of the church and for us to go and spend all eternity with him in heaven. In the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., there's a plaque with a quote from Alfred Lord Tennyson, one of his poems called Memorandum. And here's what he says in that poem, part of the poem. He says, one God, one law, one element, and one far off driven event to which the whole creation moves. The rapture. Jesus Christ is going to return to the return to planet Earth, and that's the main event to which all of creation, as Tennyson said, is moving toward. And beloved, you and I can trust our lives and we can trust our futures to the Lord who made that promise. Amen? Jesus made an extended forecast about the future. And you can be 100% certain that what he says, it will happen. It will happen, beloved, as he said it would. Let's pray. Well, Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Father God, that you gave us an extended forecast, part of which has happened already, part of it has not. But that part that has already happened has happened 100% accurately. And because you are God, the part that not, has not happened yet will happen 100% accurately. And we can put and bank our fortune on that and we can bank our future on that. We can even bank our very souls on that. Father God, I pray that you will lead us, that you will guide us today. That you will help us see that there is only one way to heaven through the blood of Jesus Christ and Him alone. I pray that, Father God, as you speak to hearts today, that they will be obedient to you and that they will obey your spirit promptly and do as you are calling them to do. Father, we thank you that we can hear your word, that we can read your word, we can study your word. But, Father God, I pray most importantly that we apply your word. And even in all the chaos of the world that's going on around us today, and yes, even in future days, even the persecution of we believers, that we will stand firm in the faith and we will not compromise your scriptures. Lead us and guide us now, Father, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to please stand, take your hymnals. Turn to page 305.